Hello and welcome to the screencast for Lab 5. All right, I'm going to start by downloading the files for this lab. Okay, select everything here and download. Move this into, there we go. I'm gonna give this a more conventional name so that it's not the, the long file name. There we go, lab five. Okay, and I'm gonna change the look of this just a little bit so that it is easier for you all to see. There we go. Uh, now I don't get rid of this. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Move this over just a twitch. Okay, but before I jump into the actual coding for this lab, the screencast um, that focuses on uh, the actual running of the code and how we interpret it is going to be. Um, relatively straightforward this time, mainly because you already know how to use our studio. You know how to do this analytical work in the sense that you know how to run code, you know how to modify the instructions that are given here. And so really um, what I want to say before I start walking through some more of the techniques is that before we start with the actual analysis, you've got to start by thinking about these data, thinking about what are the data here? What's a question that I want to ask? What is a, um, you know, a take, an angle on these data? That's really the most important piece. A couple of things to keep in mind as you do that is that you can't run everything, right? You, um, you can't possibly use every single analytical technique that we have learned in this class with these data and so instead, what you want to think about is what are some questions that the techniques that I've learned could inspire with any data set? And what are some questions that these data sets that I'm going to be working with inspire in particular? This last lab, well, it's the last computational lab in the class, is really about pulling everything that you've learned together. This is um, a complex data set. Uh, or set of sets of data and you've got all these techniques at, at techniques at your disposal and so really this lab is about thinking through what's the analysis that I want to do what's the analytical approach that I'm going to take and then carrying that out and through this screencast we'll put a few more tools in your toolbox but what I would do if I was you before you even look through the screencast is to take a look at the assignment description I'm going to walk through it in a moment and then to scroll through the script to see what are the techniques that um, Dr. Barber is going to cover in this in the rest of this screencast. And then you might kind of zoom around in the screencast to pick out the particular ones that you need. Um, so this data set is actually one that you have already seen in a much more simplified form. The very first lab that we did in this class, we analyzed and visualized a set of data of about 21 people in uh, different departments, all reporting up to one person in charge. And that's the reports to data. But you not only have reports to, you also have um, among these same uh, managers, you have data about advice seeking, right? The advice seeking relationships among the managers. You have uh, information about friendship. And then you also have information about reports to, that is, who reports to whom, what's the reporting structure inside this organization, and you have the information about the high-tech attributes. As before, these data are a classic network data set, and so you can go to the UCI Net page and read about how are they collected and, and what the kind of meaning of them is. But again, before you jump into your analysis, think about what are the kinds of questions that I could ask, what are the kinds of questions that that these uh, data inspire and be selective in what you calculate. Uh, the rest of the instructions are going to be relatively straightforward and uh, are at least consistent with what we've done in the past. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, let me turn my attention to 
the actual R for this. Now I've gone and navigated to the folder where I saved all the files for this lab and I'm gonna set this as my working directory and make sure that iGraph is on. It's not, so I can either run the code or I can use the interface to run the code for me. And I wanna turn this on, okay, there we go. Now, this time I'm gonna be working with um, a couple of sets of data that you've seen before as the example data. Remember, the point of these screencasts is to walk you through how to use these techniques, which then you'll go and apply to the Crackheart Manager data. Uh, so I need the Zachary data. This is the Karate Club data. Um, and I have removed a bunch of commenting from the uh, uh, information here because you're already somewhat familiar with what these data look like, how they work, uh, and how to encode them. Uh, the Zachary data, I'm using the Zachary data set that's not uh, weighted, and so you need to look at the information about the um, Crackheart Manager's data and see is it weighted, is the diagonal meaningful or not, uh, and so forth. Okay. So we have our undirected data of 34 nodes with 78 individuals between them. And I also need our attribute data for this, um, these sets of commands. And so this code, notice this code is different than the code above, right? I bring in the data, I pull it in as a, a matrix, a, a data object, but then I use this graph from adjacency matrix to create a graph object, that file that uh, iGraph will use. This graph from adjacency matrix, you make from information about relationships among actors. We also have data about the actors themselves, and we bring that in. This is a very similar to this uh, code, but um, we wouldn't use this code for that attribute data. Instead, I just want to make sure that I can match up the data that, that iGraph knows that the, the nodes inside the graph object that I've created have the same names as this other set of data that I'm gonna bring in. And let's just look at that for a second, right? This is the Zach data. It's all those ties between individuals in there uh, in the Zachary Karate Club. And this is um, the, the person that they supported, the strength of that support and the club that they ended up joining in the end. The Zachary Karate Club data, if you're not familiar with it, is the story of a club that ultimately divided, Karate Club that ultimately divided into two different clubs. And that's what this last column is here. And I want to bring that club information in. And that's what this does here. This is saying create vertex information in G. Zach, which is the graph object that I created, create vertex information in GZAC called club. And I want to pull that information from the Zachary attribute data that I encoded. And I want the club column and, I, and then use this data mix to match it up. And then if I look at my summary, you'll see that it added this club information down here. I'm also gonna need the Florentine families data because some of the analyses that we're gonna be doing are gonna be comparing any two different um, networks from the same, or two different uh, network relations from the same network of nodes. And so I'm gonna use the Florentine families and business data. Again, this should all be relatively familiar to you. Um, here we go. Right, I have my 16 actors in the business case, there are 15 ties among them. And in the family case, there are 20 ties among them. And as before, these are undirected, unweighted data. And I can look at a plot of Zach, there they are, and a plot like club, it's a, there we go, zoom in there a little bit. It's the the size of the nodes, um, the size of the text is so large because of, I've changed the preferences for, for iGraph. Hopefully yours won't look like that, but you can use the commands to adjust the size. So this should be familiar to you. Okay, so in this lab, pulling it all together, um, first thing I can do is, again, look at some of the basics of the lab, right? So I could calculate graph density for the business and family networks to see that they're different, right? That one is a little bit more dense than the other. 
I can use this club information to pull out and say make two subgroups. This is something that we did previously in class, right? So now instead of having one, just one network of all the karate club folks, I have um, two sub networks of the club that ended up um, forming around person number one and the club that ended up forming around person number 34. And I know this because if you see, here's all the um, club data for each vertex in the overall um, graph object. And what this does is it says create a subgraph from GZAC where uh, the vertex information for club equals one and the copy and delete portion of the code is just to get rid of everything else. If it doesn't match one, get rid of those nodes, get rid of those links that they're connected to. For 34, it's the same thing. And so now I have two separate sub networks created from that overall network, which I can plot, I can look at. This is the 34 group. Uh, and then I can also look at the density of those two and I can see that they're, that the group around person number one was a little bit more dense than the group around um, person number 34, although they're, they're really close to each other. Uh, again, I can do reciprocity and transitivity. This is, this is codes that you've done before and I can apply that um, to each one. I can look at the clustering coefficients and then calculate the mean clustering coefficients around um, each club, right? So this is, this is a review in a way. I can do the same thing for centralization right? I can look at the, those global techniques, um, which is maybe something that you did in the last lab, but certainly for this lab, um, you have these, these multiple networks, advice, friendship, reports too, so there's a lot of comparisons. You can also um, use some of the group analytical techniques that we learned, right? I could look for cliques inside Zachary and see what that showed me. I could look for the, the largest cliques, inside Zachary. In this case, there are two five-person cliques. I showed you this code in a class and lecture, but it's here as well. Uh, I can um, create a list of all colors here equals orange. And what I'm trying to do is zero in and code just that part of the clique where, um, the, uh, where those largest cliques were because I want to see them as white nodes. And that's what I'm doing here. And then if I plot using that vol color information that I created, you can see it, it colors those nodes for me. So this way you can, you can look for cliques, but you can also highlight them in your data using this information. You can create a list of people that you're gonna label orange and then change just the ones that you want um, to, to single out. And you could use, of course, any colors that you wanted. This is the coreness commands that I created. If you want to look at the documentation for coreness, uh, there it is. Uh, I'm storing this information as KC because I can later on, I can use this KC information in order to plot the K cores in order to show them off. Same thing here. Oop. There we go. I'm going to close that down. I can also look for components. This is going to be super boring in the Zachary Karate Club data because it's all one big component. In the Florentine family business data, things are a little bit more interesting because there are some isolates, but then there's one large component inside there. There they go. All right. Um, I can also try out some of those clustering algorithms in order to try and find subgroups. Again, I'm going to run the clustering algorithm for edge betweenness, and I'm going to save that as CEB. Oh, let's see. I wonder what was wrong with my. Oh, it, it's I'm getting this error because of the. Um, because of my plotting engine, because everything is so big. Okay, um, 
this CEB saves the results of the clustering edge betweenness, right? I just run clustering edge betweenness on GZAC, and I could call this whatever I wanted. I just am giving it a name that I can remember, cluster edge betweenness, CEB, uh, because then I can draw on that to show some of the clustering, right? This shows me where the clustering is um, according to edge betweenness, this edge up here. Removing this edge, this is the strongest kind of brokering edge in the network, and removing it breaks the groups out. I can see that with that kind of visual, but I can also plot um, using the CEB information, uh, Zachary itself, and that command, that's what this looks like, right? And there's person number 10 all by their lonesome. But using the clustering, the edge between this algorithm, this is the sort of best guess that they could make about what the groups look like. And I can also look at the modularity of, of these clustering. And again, modularity is a, a way of um, kind of comparing different clustering approaches to see, you know, do, do these clusters fit the pattern of relationships among the groups, right? That's what modularity is. Modularity gives us a, a measure of how well the um, clustering that we've created actually fits the underlying data. And now this is a different algorithm. This is um, fast and greedy, um, which is just a different set of choices and you can see that things look a little bit different here and if i plot it you can see that there's slightly different subgroups right there are slightly different clusters again person number 34 person number one is part of this cluster here and then there are some folks that are kind of in the middle here okay and if i run the modularity for that one you can see the modularity is lower Right, so in this case, edge betweenness as a clustering algorithm better fits the data than the fast and greedy algorithm. Let's, let's see one more. This is the label propagation algorithm. You can read more about those in the, in the material from class. There we go. Now this, this one looks slightly different still. We have this core group and then these folks that are a separate group and probably a separate group because really they're only connected to person number one, not well connected to anyone else. And we can see well, how well does this fit the data and it's the lowest still, right? CLP here. So this last algorithm involves iteration, meaning that based on some random changes, the results may be slightly different on your end. Um, but in this case, this, this clustering, if I run it again, let's just look at it. You can see it's slightly different, right? Because this one involves iteration. It's not an algorithm that's based on something that will return the same results every time, right? And as you can see, those results can, can vary quite a bit. And so for iterative approaches, one of the things that we do, although you're not required to do that for this lab, is to run multiple iterations and look for what's the average result that we get. And that captures some of the uncertainty around how different the results might be due to um, iterating. I'm gonna go back to the CEB, the uh, edge between this clustering that was created, and I wanna look and see what were the communities that that created. In other words, what were the groups that were found, and that lists off the people in the group, I can also um, see how many clusters there are. There are five of them. Um, I can also uh, see what the membership are. This membership is particularly useful if I wanted to save this information later on for plotting and things like that. I can also look at all the edges that um, are cr across these groupings, which I think is a, an interesting one. Um, and I can also bring this information back in. So I could add in the membership back to GZAC, right? And then now I have this information about um, the vertice vertices that were the groupings that I created. And so if I, if I want to plot them, but I don't want to plot the, the standard plots um, that I get from iGraph, this is those same groups, but here I'm using that community information to assign colors to the nodes.
Um, we also learned about assortativity. Assortativity is a measure of um, birds flocking together, right? Birds of a feather flock together. And I'm gonna use this assortativity nominal. In this case, I'm using nominal because there isn't anything um, that meaningful about using a one or a 34 to designate the two clubs. It's just the, the number of the people, right? But it's not that club one is 33 less than club four, right? It's just that they're labels. I could call them anything. I call them club A and club B and it would be just the same. And that's what nominal means here. Nominal as in named data, as opposed to continuous. You know, if I, I have the information here about the intensity of their support, if I wanted to see if people who really believe strongly about the, the person they supported flocked together, then I could use just sortativity, which would be more appropriate when the data are continuous, when, there's a, when, the, when they are meaningful differences between, say, someone who got a one and someone who got a two, right? Okay, so let's look at assortativity. In this case, the assortativity is very high. Assortativity ranges just like a correlation from negative one to one. And when assortativity is high, it means there's a lot of homophily. When it's closer to one, there's homophily. When it's closer to negative one, it means there's a lot of heterogeneity. And when it's closer to zero, it means there's a balance, right? There's not much homophily or heterogeneity. And in this case, that's not that surprising, right? The fact that in the karate club there was homophily according to cl the club that they ultimately ended up in makes sense. And you can even see that just looking at the visual. There are a lot more ties among people who are the same than there are ties across the blue and orange nodes here. But that's what assortativity is. We also um, have one more technique that I want to show you that's a bit of a stretch technique. And that is the um, quadratic assignment procedure or looking at a correlation between two uh, networks. Now, the reason I say this is a more stretch procedure is because almost everything that we've learned in this class so far has been descriptive. I wanna see if this, what, what this network looks like. Um, and in statistics, you have kind of two broad categories of analytics that you can do. One is descriptive, where you're just trying to describe and understand the actual data that you're working with. And then there's inferential. And the point of inferential statistics is to say, well, how um, likely is what I'm observing do just to chance. In other words, if I'm comparing two groups and their, their result on centralization is different, one question I could ask is, well, is the difference that I'm observing a meaningful difference? In other words, you know, if one is a 98% and the other is a 99%, are those meaningfully different numbers or is the difference just due to chance? And those are the kinds of questions that you grapple with and when you're trying to make inferences that go beyond the particular data that you have to describe um, kind of what might be true genuinely. I can say, yes, those numbers are different. The, the scores, the centralization in this group and this group are different. The modularity of this group and this group, they're different. But, um, and for those data, that's true. But then the question comes again, um, it, would it be generally too true, you know? And, and so that though is material for another class. We're not gonna learn about um, random graph modeling or um, making inferences with, with network metrics. That's an advanced um, network analysis class. But I did wanna show you one t uh, technique. We read about this technique in, um, the public health networks. If you'll recall, the, the researchers compared the communication networks and the productivity networks to see if there was an association among them. And there was. Remember that what we found is that there was a tendency uh, in those data in the communication network, if a link existed, then it was more, it was likely to exist in the productivity network and vice versa, right? Um, and that's what this correlation between network data tells us. And, and so I thought it would be fun to just be able to do that. And it's even if you don't get at the inference of, well, is the correlation I'm seeing likely due to chance or not? Um, is it kind of meaningfully different from zero or not? Um, that, that, that is, um, even if we don't go to that level, it's still interesting to compare two networks to see if there's an association between them or not. In other words, does the pattern of links and missing links uh, in a set of nodes similar to, does it, is it associated with the other, right? 
So let's let's look at this. Now this command, this G core, or we're looking at a correlation between two networks, is a command that's not in iGraph, it's in SNA. So I have to have SNA on for this. Now remember, um, the way that you want to work with SNA is you want to turn it on for what you need and then immediately turn it off. Because you see here where it says the following objects are mass from package iGraph. These packages are written by folks who don't necessarily talk to each other. And so the folks who wrote SNA and the folks who wrote iGraph but wanted to include measures of betweenness and closeness and so forth, but they didn't talk to each other and make sure that they were going to use different language. And so the, two, the both packages have the same language to describe um, a similar, in this case, set of commands, although it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And it's problematic because SNA and um, iGraph use different data. iGraph uses the graph objects that we've been creating all semester, and SNA just uses the matrices, the matrix, um, or the, the mat uh, data step right before you get to the graph object. So um, I'm going to go ahead and look at the documentation for this. Again, we're looking at the correlation between two uh, graphs to see, is there a relationship among them? Is there some um, correlation? When a, a link exists in one, is it likely to exist in the other? Uh, or if there's no link between two nodes in one network, is there likely not to be a link uh, between those same two nodes in the other network? In this case, that's why I needed the Florentine family data because I have business and family ties. And so my question is, is there a relationship among them? And I can run this code. And as you can see, there is a correlation among them. It's a, it's a pretty robust correlation, but a correlation ranges from positive one to negative one. Positive one meaning that, that when a link exists in one network, it's likely to exist in another. And a negative one meaning that the patterns are opposite. When there's a link in one, there's not likely a link in the other. And when there's a blank space in one, there's um, likely a link in the other. That's what a negative um, correlation would mean. A correlation of about zero means there's no pattern, there's no relationship. And the main kind of inference that we typically ask when we're talking about um, correlation is, is the, um, the number that we see, is this 0.37 number that we see, is that meaningfully different from zero or not? Because again, what this 0.37 is, is telling us is that there is a moderate relationship between these two networks. There's a, a moderately intense connection. When a link exists in the family data, there's a moderate um, likelihood or a moderate uh, association such that the links, the same link would exist or the same absence of a link would exist in the, the business data. Um, and so one, one way we can get at that is to run this test um, and, and look and see what, it, assuming that we didn't have, we didn't know what the links, the pattern of links between these two data were, if we just randomly added links to these same networks, what is the range of correlations that we could see? In other words, if we just randomly put links into these two and compared them, what, and we did this over and over and over again, and in fact, in the test we're gonna run in a minute, we're gonna do a hundred times. So we did this over and over again, just at random, right? What would the distribution of correlations look like if they were just at random? And um, if, our 37, our 0.37 is far away from what would be typical just at random, then we can say that this 0.37 is, is um, probably not the same as just a zero. It's not the same as a random chance association that there's really something going on there. And that's what this does is this cap test runs this correlation over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. In fact, rep reps of a, a hundred, but it does it at random, right? In other words, it just randomly assigns links instead of using the actual data to see what's the, what's the range of data we could expect. And so I'm going to run that and it ran in really fast and save them. I could, I could run a thousand, um, but the computers are now so fast that even this um, goes really, really quickly, right? But I'll just go ahead and, and run 100 and then save that. Okay, so now I have my um, 100 in there. 
Um, looks like I must have clicked on something and run, <laughs> run just 100. Okay, so I'm going to look at this, the summary of the results. And this is the test value. In other words, this is what I actually got from the result. And we know that because we already ran it up here right? Um, this is what I actually got from the results. And here are the replications, replications using just random data, right? D data that doesn't necessarily come from these two networks, but just randomly putting in links uh, and seeing what the association would be. And if I just randomly put in links, then the minimum value that I would expect is a negative correlation of about 0.16. And the maximum that I would expect at random is a 0 0.30, and the typical value that I would expect, again, at random, is about a 0 0.0, uh, a negative 0 0.014, in this case, pretty close to zero. So that's, this is, th this is gonna be pretty typical, right? Because this is just at random, that there's no real association between these two networks. I'm just throwing links in there at random. And if I plot this, what you can see is, this is the distribution of what I would expect at random. And so if, they, if the two networks were not related at all, they were just two random networks that were not related at all, I would expect this test statistic to run somewhere around a zero, right here in the middle, right? Because that was about what average was. And you can see this is each of these, this line represents um, the result of one test, one random test. And I did this a hundred times. So there's a, a hundred little points on this line right? And, and a bunch of them cluster right here. Most of them cluster here. If I run a thousand, what will happen is the pattern will be the same probably, but the, um, the curve will look different, right? In other words, we got, we got more higher clusters, but they still kind of cluster around, um, right? We still kind of cluster around this, this one in the middle here. Again, this is, um, iterative. So it's, a, it's, doing this, it's running the, the test on two random networks with 16 nodes over and over and over again. And so the exact pattern will be a little bit different, but the overall pattern over and over again will be very similar. But really the point we take from this is this line right here. This line is our actual result. This is the actual relationship between the Florentine family business and family data. And the meaning of that is that um, the actual result that we got is way outside what we would expect if we were just looking at these networks at random and randomly putting in, putting in links. And so that tells us that we can have some measure of confidence that the relationship that we observe, this 0.37, is not just due to chance, that it's different from zero, right? Um, we can also see this expressed... Um, Let's see, in terms of the estimated p-value when we look at the cap results, right? That we can see that um, this says zero, it's not really zero. Um, what this really means is that it's very, very, very small. Probabilities can't be zero, but it's, you know, it's like smaller than 0 0.0001 chance that this observed correlation is just a random correlation between these two um, networks. So now that I'm done with that, I'm going to detach SNA. So as I said, the actual code that we looked at for this screencast is relatively brief compared to the other screencasts. We've had more techniques to learn. This time we have fewer techniques, but really the point is for you to think about these data, to think about what are the data that I have and how could I go about analyzing them. And this time we highlighted some techniques that should be reviewed for you, like looking at those global indicators. We also looked at um, some of the clustering that we talked about, and there's um, lots of ways that you could come at these data and look for groups. And, and um, we talked about modularity as an important indicator of the fit of whatever clustering approach that we, we took. Uh, we also looked at assortativity as an indicator of homophily, the degree to which birds of a feather are flocking together. And then lastly, we looked at correlation to see if there's a relationship between two networks. Take a look at this data 
um, figure out what your approach is going to be before you even encode any data, before you go and run any of these techniques, think about what's a question that I want to ask? What's my analytical approach going to be? And then make your own script, copy and paste from our scripts to put your own script together that lets you do just that piece so you can zero in on what you need. As always, if you run into trouble or you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out with us to us. Happy calculating. See you later.